Welcome ladies and gentlemen to the third unit of week one in the Parallel Programming Concepts course in OpenHPI. Um, today we want to talk about the ILP wall and the memory wall. Um, we already discussed in this week and in this course that there are three ways of making applications, software applications faster. Um, this is a well-known concept introduced by Jeffrey Feister. The first idea is to work harder to actually execute the instructions in the application in a faster way. The second idea would be to work smarter to process at the same speed the instruction in a smarter or more clever way in order to get an overall speed up of the application execution. And the third way would be to get help to deal with parallelization. We already um, discussed in Unit 2 that there is a problem with working harder, with increasing the processing speed of, um, in modern processor hardware due to effects with cooling and with power supply. So um, increasing the processing speed, the, uh, the frequency of modern processors is no longer possible due to the power wall problem. So the question is now, what about smarter solutions um, inside the processor hardware that again transparently could make our software run faster? A typical or traditional way of um, doing a smarter instruction processing inside the hardware is called instruction level parallelism, ILP. So the idea here is that the processor hardware itself, the control unit, the arithmetic logical units, the other parts of the proce uh, processor try to take the incoming instruction stream, assembler instructions, machine code, and try to proce process them in a smarter way in order to get faster results. And ILP is a term that summarizes several concepts out there um, that are well established there for many decades again, and they are constantly improved by the processor vendors. Um, first example for such an instruction level parallelism approach is the so-called instruction pipelining, where we have an overlapping instruction of uh, overlapping execution of serial instructions. So you have an incoming serial instruction stream, which is now internally parallelized by the processor hardware um, due to um, knowledge about the nature of the instructions and how they deal with data. Um, another example is um, a class of processor technology that is called superscalar. So in superscalar execution, um, you have multiple units inside the processor that are used at the same time. This is typically supported by special instruction sets that can um, support you in the um, programming of such processors. And at the end, if you are using the according compiler or you either do it manually, you enable the processor to perform the superscalar execution so that each coarse-grained instruction coming from the software can now be automatically parallelized inside the processor. Um, a third way of dealing with um, smarter instruction processing inside the processor hardware is the so-called out-of-order execution where the processor hardware decides to reorder your instructions in order to make them more efficient. Um, this mainly works when you have instructions that are not depending on each other, so that you don't have the situation that one instruction must be executed before the other. It, such data um, non-existent data dependencies can in many cases be detected by the hardware, um, and then the hardware can try to reorder um, activities in order to make the hardware usage more efficient. The relevant point here is that all these mechanisms work transparently for the programmer. Um, so the programmer writes um, C or whatever kind of language code, uses a compiler, and the compiler may prepare the machine code in order to use this processor mechanisms, but many of these also work completely transparent for the whole software layer. A fourth example for instruction level parallelism, where the processor has um, automated ways of dealing with um, better instruction processing, is speculative execution. This is a way of um, dealing with instructions where the processor tries to guess where future instructions will lead him to. Um, one example is the so-called branch prediction, where the processor tries to guess where future branches in your program, control flow changes, jumps, or um, maybe loops, um, where they will go to. And if the processor has this knowledge, it can start to perform data caching or any kind of smart handling of data in order to make the overall processing run faster. Um, 
there's a lot of details in this um, technology and in these ideas. Some of them can be exploited directly from software. Some of them are only transparently usable in the processor. You can modern modern uh, processors for their usage of these mechanisms. And the overall main message here is that modern CPUs, modern processor technology is packed with such logic. So this is now a new idea. This is nothing that is um, comes out of the blue, but this is well established, well known for many, many years, and it's uh, constantly supported by the compiler vendors and by the uh, programming language environments. The problem with, this I with these ILP approaches is now that um, in parallel to the Powerwall problem we have, um, it turned out that the capabilities of ILP optimization somehow are limited. So since IAP is, ILP is an idea that is there for a very long time, most of the low-hanging fruits of the well-working easy ideas are already figured out and used inside the processor hardware. So modern processors have all the um, mechanisms and possibilities that you can imagine in order to deal with such optimizations. And if you now start to continue to go that way, to exploit such mechanisms even further and try to work with them even more, you may run into situations where you over-optimize the execution. So, uh, for example, when we talk about pipelining, um, this is an approach that is shown on the picture here, where you overlap different instructions um, during the given clock cycles. If you now take such an approach and make larger and larger pipelines, um, this theoretically gives you better and better improvements in the software performance, but at some point in time, um, you run into a power consumption problem with these de deep pipelines because all of these instructions have to be handled in the clock cycles. Um, you also have a complexity problem where you may make things worse um, when you run into situations where you have to empty the pipeline for different reasons. So the high complexity of such ILP mechanisms today makes it very, very difficult to improve them even further. We somehow reached a limit here. Um, and if we introduce more aggressive ILP technologies based on the transistors we get from Moore's law, we really don't know how this acts in practice. So we may run into situations where a particular software workload is actually counterproductive, uh, where for a particular software workload, a particular ILP mechanism is counterproductive. So it makes things worse. And therefore, we have something that is called the ILP wall, which basically states that ILP-based optimization using Moore's law, using the transistors from Moore's law for getting better performance with instruction level parallelism, this is something that is capped. This is something that no longer really works. So we need other ways to deal with that problem. This is the second big wall that is commonly known and which is a common enabler for modern parallel programming trends. And there's a third one we will discuss now. And this is the idea, okay, if we can't, use, uh, can't increase the frequency and um, make processors run better by this, and if we can't use the additional transistors for smarter logic, for smarter um, computational units inside the processor, maybe we can use the transistors for better caching. So what is caching? Caching is a known concept from computer architecture, also from software development, where you have the idea of using small, fast, intermediate memories in order to speed up the access to data. When we look into caching from a hardware perspective, we could go back to the von Neumann architecture and say, okay, in the original von Neumann architecture, we had the central processing unit fetching instructions and data from the memory. These instructions then work on the data and somehow perform a particular work. Um, when we now want to deal with the problem that instructions have to fetch data items from memory over the bus, we may introduce a small intermediate memory on the processor itself. This doesn't have to be as large as the mem main memory itself, but it has to be way faster in order to deliver on us some advantage. Um, the effect that is somehow compensated here is sometimes also called the von Neumann bottleneck, which um, de um, describes the effect that you have to go through the system bus or the processor interconnect in order to fetch instructions and data from memory all the time. So caching is the idea of keeping data copies in a faster, mostly smaller memory on the CPU hardware itself. 
This is how caching works in processor technology, but the same concept also holds, for example, in large software systems where you use memory that is close by in order to keep some of the data for faster access. Caching works because in computer architecture we have a concept that is commonly known as memory hardware uh, hierarchy. The memory hardware hierarchy or the memory pyramid describes an effect that different levels of memory technolo technology we have, either volatile memory that loses the content after power goes away, or non-volatile memory, that they have a common set of properties and they gradually decrease or increase in these properties. So when you look on in this picture, you have on the top level processor registers little small memory units that are built into the processor. This is the fastest memory we can build today. Um, it's very expensive to build, so you can't afford to build larger amounts of it on a processor die without breaking your cost um, limits for the processor development. And it's very small in terms of size and capacity, so there's not, nothing, not much to store in it, but it goes very fast. The next level then is processor caches, which are a little bit bigger, so you can a little bit more data, uh, store a little bit more data into them. They're also cheaper to produce, not as cheap as main memory, but cheaper as register files, um, and they give you more capacity. Then the pyramid continues with the standard RAM, random access memory, the main memory, and then it goes over to non-volatile memory, such as hard disks or tapes or flash drives. So the memory hierarchy somehow explains us why caching actually works, because what you do is you take a piece of data that is stored on the lower levels where you have large capacities but slow access time, and you move this piece of data to a higher level of the pyramid where you have less capacity, so you have to decide what you want to cache, but at least you get a faster access time. This effect or this idea is so working so well and it's so commonly known that it's a default part of all modern technology, not only in processor hardware but also in software. So here you see a typical processor layout where you have different CPU cores, uh, computational units, and these cores are not directly attached to main memory, but they have intermediate caches. Some of them are per core, some of them are shared by the cores, some of them are even shared between different processors. So the memory hierarchy here is extended so that you take different variations of cache memory, um, which again differ in their size and their speed, and you put them between the main memory and the processor in order to get a faster data access. This is an interesting idea because what we could do now is we could use the additional transistors we get from Moore's law and just build larger caches all the time in order to get faster processor hardware. This would again give us um, better software, faster software, without actually modifying things in the software itself. This idea worked for some time and therefore caching is uh, like ILP, a well-established optimization technique for performance improvements. But the problem here is that caching relies on a concept that is called data locality. So caching only works if you actually know which data is good to cache and which data you have you can't really cache because you have rare access to it. Um, instructions that are good to cache are, for example, things that happen inside a loop. So if you in your programming language you perform a loop, then the same set of instructions is executed in a loop body all the time. So in order to avoid the processor to fetch these these few instructions from main memory again and again, they can be kept in the cache. The, second, the same idea holds for data. If you do a computation or some kind of um, analysis on a piece of data, and this piece of data is small enough to fit into the cache memory, for example on the processor chip, you can speed up the access to this data. And by doing this, you're actually speeding up um, your software. Um, this is a nice idea as long as you have such variables or data items that are frequently accessed in a small loop or in small parts of your code so that you can actually get some benefit from caches. If the cache size now increases, you can have more of such data or more of such instructions being um, evaluated in a very fast way so that your software gets faster. The problem with caching and extending cache sizes is that similar to ILP, the potential is limited. So if you extend the cache but your data locality is not 
um, accordingly adjusted in the software, you may run into the situation that the additional cache memory is simply not useful. You may do not have enough data locality inside your software in order to exploit that. So the transparent speeding up of software by having new hardware uh, being delivered with larger caches, it's, it's no longer automatically giving. So either you perform now a manual optimization, so you try to program in a cache-aware design, or you have to find other ways of exploiting the additional transistors besides extending the cache sizes. Um, since caching is limited, the last idea that may be now on the table is to say, okay, um, caching is only a solution to, um, or an intermediate solution to deal with the problem of slow memory. So maybe we just should invest all the effort into making memory faster and then the whole problem goes away and we can um, do a faster computation and software. But this also doesn't work uh, very nicely today because we have the problem that main memory is shared between all the processors given in the system and the memory bandwidth and the latency for access is somehow capped by power wall effects but also by other effects. And in the past, it turned out that the pace of performance improvements in CPU technology didn't um, match to the pace of improvements in memory performance, um, in performance improvements. So memory is not getting at the same speed faster as CPUs get faster. So there is a larger and larger gap between the performance you have in accessing the main memory and the performance you get from the CPU during the instruction processing. This leads to the fact that for um, badly designed uh, software, the processor spends most of the time waiting on memory or waiting on other things. And this effect can't be co can be compensated by caching as long as you have data locality. But if all your data locality is already used, you're still stuck with the problem of getting your data fast enough in order to perform a better processing. And these effects are typically summarized as the so-called memory wall. Um, which is another effect that hinders us to exploit new processor technology for getting better and faster software. So what is the summary of all these effects now? We have, from the hardware perspective, the situation that the number of transistors we get in processor technology is still increasing due to Moore's law. So Moore's law constantly gives us more transistors and we can use them in order to um, get a better performance. Building larger caches no longer helps because due to the memory wall um, and other effects like missing data locality, we may no longer have the chance to exploit these larger cache sizes. Processor vendors still deliver us um, processors with larger caches so you can make uh, have a try, but more and more software people see the problem that this effect doesn't work automatically. The ILP mechanisms in modern hardware are also out of options because um, due to the ILP wall, all these mechanisms are already exploited. So you have no longer a way of trusting the hardware vendor to optimize your um, instruction processing with ILP mechanisms. Voltage, power and frequency are at the limit, so we have the power wall issue. Um, this may be compensated with dynamic scaling approaches where you play around with the frequencies and try to lower them at particular points in time. But um, the only way to make an efficient use out of the increasing transistors today is to build more cores per processor chip. So the trend of having processors that are multi-core and many-core is basically arising from the fact that there is no other real usage for um, dealing with the additional transistors and to deliver something that gives the software people a chance to um, increase the performance of their codes. So Hardware people use the additional transistors to build more computational units, more cores on one processor chip, but this now leads to the situation that the software people must use these resources in order to speed up their software. The frequency is fixed, ILP no longer helps to that large amount, caching effects are limited, so the only chance to deal with um, software performance improvements is to use the cores that are delivered due to Moore's law in modern processor technology. Another aspect with this is that um, even though we can use the additional cores for faster processing, the memory wall is still there. This doesn't go away. So modern programming must not only deal with the usage of cores in a system, but also with the tackling of more and more arising memory wall issues. 
when we take now these effects, the summary of these effects, and look again on our five-star example of three ways of doing anything faster, we see the following summary situation. Working harder with increasing clock speeds no longer works because we have the power wall problem and the memory wall problem at the same time. So frequency will remain, frequencies will remain stalled and um, this will not go away as a problem in modern processor technology until we get really groundbreaking novel developments here. Um, working smarter with ILP approaches, with optimizations, with caching approaches work transpar transparently for quite a while, but meanwhile we have the ILP wall problem and also memory wall problems that hinder us from exploiting such new capabilities automatically without changing the software. The third way of parallelization, of using more cores per chip, is actually the only remaining option we have. Um, so we get more cores per CPU based on Moore's law and the hardware industry tries to deliver this in a way that software can exploit these mechanisms in order to get the necessary performance speed up. But the big difference to the earlier times is now that software can no longer ignore the problem or trust on the hardware people to solve it, but now software people have to contribute their part in order to make modern computer systems faster. Additionally, we have to deal with the memory wall problem in order to exploit the capabilities of modern IT hardware.